In the previous lesson, what we did was introduce the nature of the UK Constitution, as well as outline the distinction that is made between a codified and an uncodified Constitution before looking at the various strengths and weaknesses of both. Now, in this lesson, what we're going to do is talk about the sources of the UK Constitution. So, when we think about the sources of the UK Constitution, we can think about it as a major consequence of having an uncodified Constitution. Unlike, for example, the United States, the United States is a very good example that you can use since it is central to the comparative politics element of our A-level syllabus. We have a single codified document, and as a result of that, there is one source of the US Constitution, that is the document itself. Whereas when we think about an uncodified constitution, it not being all written down in one place, there not being this single source of authority that we can call the UK constitution. The consequence of this is that it is derived from multiple different sources, some of which are written, some of which are unwritten, some of which are legal, others are non-legal. Now, we're going to examine specifically four major sources of the UK Constitution in this lesson. We're going to exam examine what it means to have statute law as a major consequence, as a major source of the Constitution, the common law, constitutional conventions, as well as works of authority. The first two being strictly legal in nature, the second two being more political in nature. So as a basic recap from the last lesson, we have an unwritten constitution in the sense that it is uncodified. Now, written here is uh, the fact that I've said it is unwritten, when in reality, it is more accurate to say that it is uncodified, because there is a distinction between unwritten and uncodified. Unwritten implies that there is no part of the UK constitution that is written down, which is not true. Uncodified simply means that it is not all written down in one single place, in one single document. That is why I always tend to go for the idea of it being an uncodified constitution rather than an unwritten constitution. A consequence of having an uncodified constitution is that it has no legal special legal status. So there is no special legal status that exists that entrenches higher law like the US constitution, for example. We noted already that there are pros and cons of a codified and uncodified constitution. The UK did once have a codified constitution following the English Civil War. Um, this didn't last too long, as written here in brackets, and it was described as the Commonwealth Constitution under the protector of Lord uh, Oliver Cromwell, should I say. Because the UK constitution is uncodified, unwritten is different to uncodified, not written down in one single place, it means that it has its origins from a number of different sources. We'll identify the four as we go along. So let's begin with the first legal source of the UK Constitution, this being statute law. From around the 16th century, it became an increasingly established principle that Parliament would be the quote-unquote supreme law-making authority in the United Kingdom. This becomes known as the principle or the doctrine of parliamentary sovereignty, and we'll talk about that in its own separate lesson in the future. The major event which takes place in relation to this, uh, which really instantiates this idea of parliamentary sovereignty, is the Glorious Revolution of 1688. You don't need to know too much about the history of the Glorious Revolution, unless you're an A-level history student, for example. Uh, and so as a result of that, we're going to move on quite swiftly. Now, the statute law as a source of the UK Constitution consists of all the pieces of legislation passed by Parliament. However, it is seen that some of these statutes are more constitutional than others. It is generally seen by constitutional lawyers now that the, 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 the consensus is that when we say that one of the sources of the UK Constitution is statute law, we're not often referring to all statute law. We're referring to the very specific and very limited pieces of statute and pieces of legislation that are considered to be quote-unquote constitutional. These may include, for example, the 1998 Human Rights Act, the Bill of Rights of 1688, the European Communities Act of 1972, the Constitutional Reform Act of 2005. Now, there are others, and we will get to looking at further legislative reforms and legislative changes that have taken place when we examine the constitutional reform since 1997. Uh, but for now, that is just a brief overview, a brief highlight of some of the pieces of legislation which are considered to be constitutional. Now, acts of parliament that raise constitution-based questions are the ones that therefore shape and form part of the UK constitution. 
So you might be asking the question, okay, well, what is the clear distinction and delineation between a constitutional and a non-constitutional statute? And the answer to that question is that there isn't no, there's no single one rule that we can refer to. It is debated about which statutes are considered constitutional and whether or not they can be considered constitutional by doing more or not just merely raising constitutional questions. The case of Thoburn and Sunderland City Council um, gave reference to this idea of constitutional statute and in reference to the, uh, the European Communities Act, it cited the idea that constitutional, the idea of constitutionality of statute law, can be described as meaning that a statute um, cannot be overridden, cannot be read as overridden by other statutes unless very clear language is used. This is a very uh, uh, wishy-washy way of saying that a constitutional statute cannot be repealed through the parliamentary doctrine of implied repeal. So. As a very brief overview, we're going to get to this in a future lesson's time, so don't worry if you don't understand it yet, but a, a consequence of the principle of parliamentary sovereignty is that A, Parliament is the supreme lawmaking authority in the United Kingdom, and B, a Parliament cannot bind its successor. So Parliament cannot pass a law that a future Parliament cannot revoke. And one of the things that is cited as, in, as a consequence of this is something known as the doctrine of implied repeal. Let's take an example. If I passed a law in 2005 that said one thing, and then in 2010 I passed another law that says the exact opposite, without specifically re overriding or reversing that legislation, without actually saying in the 2010 statute that the previous legislation in 2005 is no longer valid, you could argue that the 2010 statute has impliedly repealed the earlier 2005 statute because it completely contradicts all of the provisions therein. Now that is something known as the doctrine of implied repeal and is a consequence of the idea of parliamentary sovereignty. Now what the case of Thoburn and Sunderland City Council cited in 2002 is that the doctrine of implied repeal may not be applicable to what are known as constitutional statutes. And if that is the case, it means that a piece of legislation like the Human Rights Act may not be repealed by simply contradicting it in a subsequent piece of legislation. If you want to repeal the Human Rights Act, you have to use very clear language that says we are repealing the Human Rights Act in that piece of legislation. So that may give us a distinction between a, a statute that is constitutional and is merely ordinary. But it doesn't give us an indication as to what actually are the characteristics of this kind of statute, of a constitutional statute. And one of the uh, ways in which we can define it is a broad set of characteristics. Usually constitutional statutes relate to the structure and formation of government, as well as the relationship between government and the people. So things like human rights legislation, constitutional reform legislation, devolution legislation as well, as well as legislation that relates to the United Kingdom's relationship with the European Union. The common law is the second major legal source of the UK constitution, and the common law is a body of law which is developed by judges on a case-by-case -case basis. It claims legitimacy as an embodiment of the values of the community given by the idea of precedent. Now, simply put, precedent is the idea that where a particular body of law, where a particular judgment has uh, been decided by a judge in a case, then subsequent cases of a similar nature ought to follow that precedent, unless there's a very good reason for uh, not doing so. So if I have a case that is decided in the 1980s, and then a similar set of circumstances arrive in 2002 uh, in, a, in a similar case, then I could refer back to this previous case in the 1980s as precedent as a citation as an example of how this particular legal issue is decided in uh, previous case law and unless there's a very good reason why that previous case law is wrong you ought to follow that precedent um, as so far as you can sometimes in the united states um, system of constitutional law it is a principle known as stare decisis now, historically, the common law actually predates Parliament, and the common law has been developed for hundreds of years, and 
arguably the origins of the common law date back to the reigns of the Angevin kings in the Angevin Empire. Now, if you want to know about the history of the common law and the development of the common law, if you're just generally curious, we have a series over on the Law Academy, which is the study of the history of English law, going from the Anglo-Saxon period all the way up to the end of the Angevin uh, Empire and into the Magna Carta. Now, that is a uh, an undergraduate and postgraduate level series of lessons on, on on the history of English law. But if some of you are particularly keen and interested to examine it, um, then there are some lessons over there if you want to just have a better understanding of this particular area, or if you're just generally curious. However, there is tension between the common law view that is championed by judges such as Coke and Blackstone and the modern political notion of the idea of Parliament being the single most powerful institution of legal, in, uh, of legal importance in the United Kingdom. We'll get to this in future lessons time. The first non-legal source of the UK Constitution is this idea of a constitutional convention. Now, conventions are rules and principles that are not legally binding, but are nevertheless accepted practice. They are general rules of thumb that um, major important people within government follow. Constitutional conventions are only binding by virtue of their acceptance by those in power. So they, the only binding authority that they have is by way of the fact that they have um, enshrined within them certain traditions and they are certainly... Uh, rules that are followed by, um, by by politicians historically. Important constitutional conventions often deal with the relationship between the three branches of government. We should note that the three branches of government are the executive, the legislature and the judiciary. So you might not understand what a constitutional convention is at the moment, and we will get to this in future lessons time as well, but it should be important to note that there are some constitutional conventions that we can use as examples of what a, of what a convention actually is and what it entails. Now, we're going to talk about these in more detail when we look at Parliament and we look at the Prime Minister and the Executive Branch in separate topics. But there are some interesting, there are some interesting conventions that are, are important to highlight. So, for example, conventions that relate to the monarchy uh, ensure the vestigial prerogative powers are normally exercised in accordance with the advice from ministers. So one of the constitutional conventions, for example, is this idea of royal assent. When a piece of legislation is to be passed into law, when a bill is to be passed into law, it must receive royal assent. Now, this is technically now a constitutional convention. There is net technically no legal authority behind the idea of the royal assent. And so as a result of this, it is a general rule of thumb that is practiced by everybody in government. It is also a general rule of thumb that the monarch accepts the bill that is being passed, any bill that is being passed. A monarch cannot reject or veto a piece of legislation being passed. Again, this is a constitutional convention, not a legally binding authority. In relation to the executive branch of government, we have the doctrine of cabinet or ministerial responsibility. And this was created through a chain of conventions. And essentially, one of the principles of this is this idea of collective responsibility. Now, simply put, if there is a cabinet decision that is being made and you have a cabinet member that disagrees with that decision, they can either shut up about it and show a united front and accept and go along with that particular decision or they must resign from government because they cannot be any kind of situation where you have uh, ministers that go against government decisions. This sometimes happens and we see violations of these conventions sometimes but this is known as the principle or the doctrine of collective responsibility. In relation to the legislature, in relation to Parliament, you have the Salisbury Convention. And what the Salisbury Convention simply does is it requires the House of Lords should not oppose a measure sent to it by the Commons, which is part of a government manifesto. So if a government, if, if, if a government manifesto says a thing, or says a, uh, makes a particular pledge towards a piece of legislation being passed, and if therefore when they win power under that manifesto, it becomes their mandate to do that particular piece of legislation, then it is not the responsibility of the House of Lords to oppose that measure. And so the Salisbury Convention protects against that particular issue. 
Finally, then we have works of authority or authoritative works. And these are a number of established political texts that are seen to make up part of the Constitution by nature of and by way of their authority, not legal authority, their persuasive authority. They are, offer guides to how political decisions ought to be made and to how the UK Constitution is supposed to be operating. So, for example, A.V. Dicey's introduction to the study of the law of the Constitution from 1884 is seen as a work of authority because of its authoritative nature in the understanding of the UK Constitution. We'll come back to A.V. Dicey in, uh, in separate lessons time. But it's important to note that this is one particularly interesting example of a work of authority. Again, it doesn't have legal authority, but it has persuasive authority.